Hello. Hey, everybody. Uh, people awake out there? Seriously? Yeah. You guys are kind of mellow. The mm. mid-afternoon sort of lull there. All right, we'll try to do something about that. Uh, I thought we'd start off maybe talking about something that's been in the news, which is there's a story out there right now that you guys at Taboola are merging with Outbrain. Is that true? What's yeah. happening? Uh, Matt, that's the Israeli version of fake news. That's <laughs> like, we, you know, as a small country, we had to take an attempt at it, and that's the best we got. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'll take your word on that. Okay. <laughs> but let, so you, you, you say that's fake news. I think that like one of the, a good place for us to start is to define what that is. Like I've heard uh, President Trump call things fake news. I think his definition may be different than mine. Yours may be different. John, what, what's your, what, what is fake news? Yeah, I think we got to be clear and define the terms here, what it is and what it isn't. Uh, I define fake news as fundamentally false news stories written with the intent to deceive. What fake news is not is saying, I disagree with that, or this offends me, or, or it doesn't fit with my political agenda. What, what Donald Trump and co. have been trying to do by labeling anything they disagree with or is unflattering them as fake news, that's just outright Orwellian, and, and that's trying to intentionally blur the line between truth and lies, fact and fiction. That's dangerous. But fake news is a real problem, but we've got to define the parameters right. Do you have a different definition, or is yours in no, line I, with that? I, I tend to agree. I think that uh, the next step after saying that is trying to actually dumb it down so that anyone can kind of figure it out. So the challenge becomes, I think people say it, and I think that's the right definition. The challenge is, if I give you 10 stories, can you find 7 out of 10 that are fake? And if you hire an army of people to do it, can everybody do the same job so that over time we can get rid of it? Uh, and I think that's, that's more tricky because it's so hard for people to actually not bring themselves into the conversation. And I see it all the time. I get calls from reporters, smart people, executives, you know, people that just uh, tell me that this set our website is fake and this site is fake and that's fake. And many because they don't know the website, it's a tiny blog, it's not what they like, they're different. So I think that the biggest challenge is to, can you write 10 things that define in a very tangible way what fake news is? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, we can get into the gradations, but at the heart, let's not blur, our, blur the fact that it's fairly simple. Again, it's fundamentally false. You know, when, when folks are kicking around at the you know, late election cycle about you know, Pizzagate and how many you know, Hillary Clinton mass murderer next door, uh, you know, whether they're motivated by propaganda um, or profit motive, because some of these cats found themselves making 10K a month off this crap. Um, that's not a jump ball. That's not, oh, this paragraph was dodgy and I'm worried about the sourcing of this quote. That was fundamentally false stories written with the intent to deceive. That's a pretty broad standard. I don't think that's subtle. I don't think that's, that's debatable, really. Adam, I, I, some people would say that your ad network, I mean, BuzzFeed has said this, has enabled fake news, that it has, there are, uh, people out there who uh, are operating sites that have news that is meant to deceive and they've got Taboola ads on them. What do you say to that? How do you respond to that? They're wrong. They're wrong. Is, is, there, is there nothing that you would call fake news on the Taboola ad network right now? If it is, it's, a mista I mean, it's, either, it's a, either a mistake or we disagree on what fake news is. I actually had a conversation with BuzzFeed reporter about that and I thought what he did was a bit dangerous because he called me and he said, there's like a list of 100 websites we found is fake news. I actually went through the, one, the list with him and I said, good job, man. Like you actually found, like you did some research and you found 100 websites. But then he said, you and Google are monetizing these four websites and they were on the list. And I said, thanks for letting me know. Let's, let's go to them together. So we op we're, I'm opening the website with the reporter and then this disclaimer comes up and it says, this is a satire website. It's meant to entertain consumers. It's not based on facts. So I told him, um, why is this fake news? And he says, well, it's not true. And I said, is The Onion fake news? And he said, no. And I told him, why not? He said, because I know The Onion. And I told him, you're a very dangerous person. And you I think Craig is a very dangerous person. The I, told him, I, mean, I told him, look, I told him humbly, right? Like, if the problem is that it's not The Onion, then you're fake. Then honestly, my English is not as perfect as the American person. Maybe I should not be here either. Like, if, if all it comes down to is if I know you and you're perfect, then you're in, then I think it sucks. I don't want to be part of that internet. Yeah, I, I think, look, it, it's not, satire gets its own zip code, but it needs to be clearly understood and labeled as satire. But, you know, sometimes these are folks just trying to, to, to blur the categories. Fair here. enough. And, um, and, and again, though, I, I think we all got to take this incredibly seriously because we're living in a time of mass information. This is not something new, but it's happening 
it's being intentionally deployed to impact elections, right? Not only the U.S. election, but the French election right now. Uh, and, and guess who's rooting for Le Pen? Um, so, so this is serious, this is real time, and everyone's gonna have a piece in solving it. I think Facebook and Google have tried to step up. I think a lot of news organizations are stepping up, they're reporting, Craig Silverman at BuzzFeed's done a great job, Ben Collins and Gideon Resnick at, our, at the, uh, the Daily Beast have done a great job. Um, but we gotta keep that, the heat on, and I think ultimately businesses need to take a degree of responsibility too, because it's the broad programmatic ad buys that are enabling this stuff unintentionally. And some of them are starting to step up and realize they're gonna have to either blacklist or whitelist sites. Right. Um, but, but that's the other way, you, you know, you, you, you gotta follow the money, and, and if you, once you remove the profit, a lot of this stuff will disappear, not all. And I, I wanna add to that, so I mean, I agree with that, and I think, look, everybody makes mistakes, pointing fingers is easy. I can tell you from my perspective, I pay 30 people a salary to review content and reject things that we think as, as our policy, whether it's true or not, or people like it or not. You know, we care, we, I pay people to do it. Like, you know, so I, I'm not sure that's something Facebook is doing as an example, right? So, you know, I know I care. I'm not sure I'm perfect, but I know, you know, I know I give, uh, I care about this enough. So I think companies need to have some, some line and we also offer whitelists. I'm a bit afraid of that trend as well, to be perfectly can you guys, honest. Can you guys define what a whitelist means? What, yeah, whitelist means that there's a list of safe places, uh, like websites, that your ad will appear only on those websites. So as an example, the New York Times is safe. W WSJ is safe. Uh, the Beast is safe. Uh, oh, yeah, <laughs> BuzzFeed, you know, it's safe. safe. But, you know, but, but, but the thing is that now there's a trend of saying, here's 200 websites. They're safe, you'll only be within those. The only thing I don't super like about it is that I don't think it's, there, do you know the website IFL Science by a raise of hand? A lot of people do. So IFL Science is not, you know, it's not WSJ, we don't know the name, like we didn't grow up knowing the name, but it's one of the most, most amazing science blogs out there. That may have not been included on a whitelist site, even though it's an amazing site. Well, right, that, that, that's the question. What do, what do you do with news, with news sites that are becoming established before Daily Beast was established, before BuzzFeed was right. established? How do they get on that whitelist? Well, I, I think, first of all, uh, by, by what they're doing day in and day out. Right? The mark of a fake news site isn't one story that goes sideways. It's whether their intention is to deceive, you know, whether you know, it, it's 100 news sites that pop up in Macedonia cheering at the conservative yeah. cause at the end of the election. Um, but it, it, I think that's why, there's always gonna be the who will watch the watchman problem, and we need to take that seriously. Um, but I think you need to, it's, it's whether people are trying to do it right, and make sure that that, that process of, of winnowing it down or a la carte opting in isn't being driven by political judgments or otherwise. I mean, I would say there's a fundamental difference between what Sleeping Giants did with Breitbart, which is, is alerting folks that their, their ads were appearing on Breitbart, whether they knew it or not because of these broad buys, and, and, um, and uh, National Journal or the Weekly Standard. Right? It, it's not about the politics of it, it's about the professionalism of it. It's whether you're trying to play the lowest common denominator with you know, hate clickbait uh, and, and confirmation bias, and that's how this stuff really proliferates. Adam, I'm gonna pick on you a little bit, because you said you had 30 people who were looking for fake news. I found a story just like minutes before we went on stage with a Taboola ad on a site called uh, Biz Standard News, which seems sort of legit, right? I mean, it's legit looking enough. And the headline is, Fox News employees rated Megyn Kelly most likely to have sex with a black guy. And it goes on to, like, uh, say, a, a, you know, the Business Standard News continues to receive scandalous news about the behavior of Fox News male employees. It's not, it's, it, it's not a funny story. Like I, like, I can understand how you might say it's satire, but it's, it's an, it's, it seems clearly meant to deceive. How can, how can you defend having stuff that's on there like that that maybe it winkingly says it's satire, but the intent is obviously to, to provoke people? So we, you know, it's, I don't want to be, I'm not a censor and I'm not a fact checker. And I think if I look at any publishers, including the New York Times, they wrote things about Israel that I'm telling you are inaccurate. Now the intent may not have been evil. And I think intent is an important yeah. uh, metric here, currency. So what we do is that we, we review the website. If we think a lot of what they write, uh, when we review it for the first time, it meant to deceive, is using uh, celebrity imagery to try to get me to click on it without having the rights to do it. They're trying to borrow people's logos so the site looks like it's, it has the credibility of BuzzFeed, but it's not. Then we reject it. Um, and sometimes we make mistakes. So if there was a website that got you know, filtered in and we, someone told us about it, we'll, we'll kick it out. 
but what, what I think is important is that I'm trying not to not be the, the person that says, if the website is too funny or, t or making political statements that are annoying, I don't like it. Yeah. And I think that's a, it's, it's a really slippery slope. And I think, and by the way, I think over time we'll refine the line that we have. Today I block 50%, so 50% of applications to Tabula to be distributed are filtered, which means I'm spending a lot of energy huh. taking people out. And I think over time I get better at it. Um, and maybe the website you're talking about should not be on Tabula, and that's something we, we should, maybe, maybe we can get better at. But I still think that the tricky part is the, the censorship area where it's tricky. This is the Breitbart question, kind of, right? As an example. Right. You looked like you wanted to jump in there when he was... Sorry, say it again? So you looked like you wanted to jump in there. Was there something that you... Yeah, were... well, no, I mean, look, we, we got to be really vigilant about not buying into the slippery slope of satire or the definition of fake news, which is saying that it's anything I dislike, trying to actually distract people from the real problem of fake news by politicizing the term, right? And, and, and the fact is, is that as surreal as it may seem, that uh, you know, President Trump in the White House is leading this charge, not just calling journalists the enemy of the American people, but by calling sites like, you know, whether it's CNN or Wall Street, uh, you know, Washington Post, fake news because they publish things he doesn't like. I mean, he went as far to say that if you, if you see a poll that has negative news, consider it fake news. That's incredibly dangerous. That's incredibly demagogic. And you, so you gotta keep our terms defined and and, um, and 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 you know not get muddied in the definition of this and i will say also just today uh cheney j school announced in partnership with storyful and some other folks uh, a brand new initiative and i think it's one of many because a lot of people are working on this as journalists as as, as businesses as consortiums trying to um, in this case i believe it's called united um brand safe and they're trying to do a a, a whitelist effort but the fact it's a school working with a company um, these are the kind of partnerships we're going to need. But this is all hands on deck right now. Um, and, and again, yeah, there's a French election going on. It could have another major impact on. But democracy is just as much at stake as, as people taking advantage of a badly broken business model, which we've got to fix simultaneously. I also think, Matt, that we should try to think of actually educating consumers about yep. how to identify fake news. Because if I can hire 30 people, junior people, to do it, then maybe there is a chance that, I'll give you an example. Would you ever order sushi when you fly from San Francisco to New York? On the flight itself, I no. Uh, yeah. Would you eat fish? Would you, would you eat fish on the plane? Absolutely not. Exactly. Why would you not do it? Uh, it just seems like it would be disgusting. I don't know. Because fish is something you rather eat fresh. Yeah. Right? right. And same goes when you see this funny restaurant in New York City. That's like you know you may buy falafel from it, but you wouldn't buy fish from it, right? So we kind of know it by now. So I wonder if there's a way for people to know, and maybe use companies like BuzzFeed the Beast and Tabula to distribute knowledge so that my mom can say, what is this bullshit? This is fake. I mean, part of the, part of the problem, though, is that people can't do that, and they have a friend who they trust on Facebook or, whomever, or wherever that shares it, Twitter, um, and you naturally build in that trust because this is someone who's you know, who's, who's, who I have a relationship with. I don't think they're trying to deceive me. They probably aren't trying to deceive them. They're probably right. deceived themselves. And uh, I mean, so how do, you, how do you get people to the point where they're gonna start questioning the stuff that, they're, that, they're, that their trusted confidence but, share? But I like to think of problems in Pareto, right? So I think that's 20% of the problem. 80% of the problem is that it's relatively easy to get scale to a fake story, right? So just to give you an idea, if I pay $10,000 to Facebook uh, or or someone that would accept it like that with such scale, I can get a piece of story read between 100,000 times to half a million times. I don't need to be your friend on Facebook to get you to read it. I can target you for two cents a click. So fake news has been around forever. The only, the only thing that changed is that now Trump is a president. And two, the pipes are out there that can provide scale for stories to be distributed. Yeah, and, and that's why there's a degree of responsibility with the platforms, right? And, and you know the problem is is that you know your 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 uncle Irwin might get duped, but then he becomes a deceiver. And it is about confirmation bias meets clickbait, right? That's why the stuff proliferated. Um, and and you know just because folks weren't passing around maliciously doesn't mean it doesn't have a malicious impact on our democracy. And so we're going to have to innovate ways to flag things for folks. Um, I think you know Facebook and Google are starting to do it. Corporations are going to need to stand up too and step up and be part of the solution here. Um, because they don't necessarily want, they certainly don't intend their broad programmatic ad buys to sponsor or peer next to hate news or fake news. 
Um, and so that's part of a, of a white listing or supporting quality sites. But it's going to be a multi-front approach, but I cannot emphasize enough the urgency we should feel. We are hurtling towards something that is just quite frankly Orwellian. And, um, and, we're all, and I think people are stepping up to confront it. And, and ultimately, it's also about the fact that you vote with your eyeballs and your wallet every day, and you need to be careful what you click on and what you pass around, and, and calling out people who are offending. Uh, you know, not your sensibility, not being offended personally, but someone is trying to deceive you and stir up the worst possible emotions of people on the internet w using lies. And, and, and that's what we got to call out to stand up. John, you talked about it being sort of an existential threat to democracy, but it's Ultimately. also, it's, it's even greater than that, I believe, right? Like one of the biggest categories that we've seen outside of politics is news about health. And you can be deceived into, into thinking that, that vaccines are harmful for you, for example. Um, it's, 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 I mean, it really does threaten kind of the fabric of society in addition to the, to the political life of society, Yeah, right? and, and the health one's a, a, a fascinating, disturbing one. You know, to, to me, the most important quote uh, for our times is actually an old quote by Daniel Patrick Moynihan, which is, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but not their own facts. Now, that, that can be a, a bright, broad line, but you get to issues like scientific debates, and it, 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 it can appear like a jump ball, but with huge health implications, whether it's in macro public health or micro, you know, individuals' decisions about self-diagnosis and what to take. Um, that may be an even more difficult genie to put in the bottle than, than sort of monitoring political debate to make sure that you know, things are rooted in facts. But I think it illustrates the, the danger and the scale of what we're, we're dealing with here. You know, we're, we're not going to, we need to recognize that, yeah, P.T. Barnum said there's a sucker born every minute, and you know, there's some truth to that. But, but the larger truth is that self-governing societies depend on enlightened opinion. That's really our job at the end of the day, at least as journalists. That's a big part of our job. It's also the job of teachers. That's the job of civic leaders. It's supposed to be the job of politicians. But God knows they fall short most of the time. Um, but we all got to take that really seriously, all of us, as digital citizens, as, as much as anything else. Is it the job of the platforms as well? Yeah, I, you, you can't separate it. Yeah. Um, you know, it, you can't take credit for you know helping bring about the Arab Spring and then you know you know look, look at things that go sideways intentionally because armies of Russian bots are deployed and then said, look, we you know we're, we we had nothing to do with it. Um, the platforms have a responsibility. And, and I think some of them are trying to step up and take responsibility, but this is happening on their watch, and they have a responsibility as well. It, it would have not happened otherwise. So I, there's no doubt platforms have to be part of it. Yeah, and, and you got to just you got to go after the money too. That that'll remove a large part of the incentive structure and strong it. Not all of it. Won't do the propagandistic crap, but but if you go after the profit motive, it'll cut off a lot of it. Guys, I think that's a good note to end on. Thank you so much for a lively discussion. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks. Thanks, guys.